record. Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library. I'm really excited to be here with Dr. Carol McCoy, who is going to be talking about hidden gems in town records. So for all of you genealogy um, you know, enthusiasts, this is going to be perfect for you. Um, before we get started, I just want to say a couple things. One is um, I'd like to thank the friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting this and all of our programs. I would also like to thank Carol for letting us um, partner with some other libraries in the area because when part when we partner with libraries and we all get together, I feel like we can make some magic. So I'd like to thank to thank Carol for that and to welcome patrons from Millis, Medway, Stowe, and Rowley. Um, that is exciting to me. <laughs> um, we are recording and I will send out a recap afterwards. And Carol wrote in the chat that she we will, I will also send out a PDF of um, a six-page PDF afterwards. So don't have to worry about taking like really um, you know, furious notes either. Um, so Carol, who I am very excited to introduce, and she's gonna be talking about those old awesome notes that you can find in town records. She's been um, researching her own family history for over 30 years, and she's the president of Find Your Roots in Brunswick, Maine. So she knows of which she speaks. Um, Carol, I'm gonna hand it over to you, and you are more than welcome to just take it over. Um, oh, forgot one thing. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I can let Carol know what they are um, probably after her presentation. She will have stops in the middle of her presentation to, to ask questions and um, we will take do a full Q&A at the end. Thank you so much, Carol, it's all yours. Oh, thanks so much. Well, this is one of my favorite topics, um, but I say that about all my talks because I wouldn't talk on it if I didn't really love it. A lot of this will be focused on uh, Massachusetts and a great deal of it in Maine, where I happen to live right now. And what we're, we'll be talking about are really these old town books that are located for the most part at uh, town halls and city halls. I wanna tell you a little bit about sort of my history with them. When I started seriously researching my family, in the 1980s, there certainly was nothing online and there wasn't even emails. So when you did research, you definitely either had to go someplace, call somebody or write them old fashioned letters in snail mail. Even when the records came online, I tended to focus on other records and only when other sources dried up did I finally start using town records. And then when I used them, I wasted a lot of time because I didn't really understand what they were about and how to use them. So I'm hoping this talk to inspire you to use them and to use them well. Our agenda will be, we will be looking at some of the, we'll be looking at benefits and examples of using them, but also some challenges and why people don't use them very well or don't use them at all. And we'll look a lot about how towns began because that had a huge impact on what the records were like and what town government is like. So we'll look at the creation of New England towns. Who were the town proprietors? What was so hard about getting a settlement going so that a town became incorporated? Because that had a huge impact on what people wanted to record. Who are some of the town officers who were required to deal with these challenges? How do you actually find the town records? And what are some keys to success, otherwise known as pitfalls I fell into that I hope you won't? Then we'll have a summary and questions and answers. So why use town records? Well, I think this, this quote is just perfect. It's by Anne. Smith Lanehart, who wrote Digging and Digging for Gold, Genealogical Treasure and New England Town Records. Town records are the most overlooked source of biographical information on New Englanders. So if you want to know something more than birth, death, marriage, you really can fill out what the life of your ancestor was like, as well as finding the vital records. However, not everybody uses them right away. Well, why is that? Well, for one thing, they can be hard to find. So there are a lot of, now in Boston, you know where City Hall is, you can find it. Or in some places like Worcester. But in little towns like Bowdoin in Maine, 
<laughs> you can see here the town sign. I took a picture of it. This is after the winter when the snow plow knocked it over. And so not only was it knocked over, it was buried in the snow. So when I say it's hard to, it's hard to even find the town office. And the town hours can often be uh, really restricted. So it can be challenging. You see this gigantic safe here. Clerks are to pr protect these records. They are public, but they decide, the clerk decides whether or not it's safe to have you look at the original records or are they gonna look up a particular record that you ask for? Generally, they're not indexed. And even if they are, they're not indexed like a book is with every single name. They can be very hard to read because of the old handwriting and very interesting spelling, one of my favorite parts of it. But also they cram stuff into small spaces because paper was so expensive. And many people, stop looking once you find birth, marriage, and death of the people that you're looking for. In addition, while FamilySearch.org has many of the films microfilmed, there are many gaps in the records, and a lot of them maybe stop in 1850 or 1860, which leaves you know 170 records not accounted for. And some of the ones you really want to look at are locked so that they have to be viewed at a family history center or as this sign over here, which is taken from the microfilm for Essex Town Records, volume one says, old original books, dirty pages, torn pages, smeared ink, mending tape, poor copy throughout, remainder of volume, tight binding. In other words, good luck trying to read this, or they can be mislabeled. So I was looking at some uh, microfilm of some West Virginia records, and they said it was from 1828. And then I came upon mixed in there in the microfilm were some 1928 records. Did they just think anything with 28 belonged in there? So, so when you're going through, you really need to look at the microfilm. And it can be like finding a needle in a haystack. Well, why bother to go ahead with this? Well, there's lots of things you can find in town records. Certainly vital records are there. They're sometimes in se separate books or they may be mixed in. Historical events. So for example, in the beginning of the vital records of Brunswick, Maine, I found that in March of 1755, there was a hurricane that shook most of New England. I didn't know that. So there are all sorts of things like that or that like when they signed the Declaration of Independence, they copied it in to the town records and sometimes they even had John Hancock's gigantic handwriting take up half the page. Um, it was a facsimile. If your ancestors were among the first settlers of the town, you may have a listing of the whole family group that's there. You'll certainly see the town meetings and the listing of the town officers. There were so many different officers that the probability if your family lived in a town for 10 or 20 years, that they were one of them is very high. Animals were very precious. And so there were markings. Uh, often there were crops of the ear or they were branding. And if the animals wandered around into the pound, you'll see both the registration of the animal markings as well as whether animals have been picked up. The qualifications to vote varied for different officers. So just because you could vote for town officers didn't necessarily mean you could vote for Congress or you could vote for the president and vice president. So you'll see lots of lists of voters. There'll be lists of who could serve as the jury pool. So it wasn't necessarily who was on there, but that may list like 150 people for a town that had 300 males in it. Roads that were both proposed and discontinued contain wonderful clues. As you know, New England has lots of ordinances and you'll get to find out what some of these are. And everything got taxed, particularly to support the church, but other things as well. And so you'll often see lists of these, including what people were taxed. There'll be various property transactions, such as who bought a pew in the meeting house. What were the boundaries of the town, which often changed as the town got bigger or smaller, depending on what was happening? Were there local disputes and arrests? You'll see the sheriff is, or the constable is told to go out and bring so-and-so to the jail, or you'll see warnings out of town. Fascinating things about budgets 
and expenses. So chances are your ancestor did something that the town maybe reimbursed them for. You needed licenses to do everything, including having a ferry, run a ferry or an inn or an ordinary uh, to ritual, to be a retailer of victuals or spirits. How the paupers were handled was in there and how diseases were handled. I'm gonna call your attention to the Rumford Ferry. This was a picture in my grandfather's photograph album. When I first was coming to Maine in the early 1950s, my dad's Buick went on one of these ferries. It was totally terrifying. So as I mentioned for vital records, they might've been in separate books or they might've been mixed in with town records. The Massachusetts town clerk, vital and town records, and that list from 1626 to 2001 are indexed on familysearch.org and ancestry.com. Certainly all towns are not in there for all dates. You need to check. So I was interested to look up somebody from a town that was part of the town that became Ashland in 1846. And I saw that the death family was very prominent. And I found the name Wait Still Death, which I thought was an incredibly cool name. So I typed in Wait Still Death in the, um, in the index and I typed in Framingham and up popped a bunch of different Wait Still Death records. One of which was this record from Sherburne, which was at one point partially carved out to become Framingham. And it said that wait still death, ye wife of John Death Esquire deceased ye 22nd day of June, 1750. And then I love the name below it, Abigail Crackbone. These records are fun to look at just to see what people's names were. Do you suppose this was a, um, a chiropractor? I, you know, or did he fall out of a tree and get that name? So I thought about the name death. And there, if you read the history of Ashland, there were lots of people named death. Some people didn't like that. So they changed the name to dearth, which means lack. But then in 1855, some of the members of the death family petitioned the Massachusetts court to legally change their name from death to how, which does seem a lot better. Uh, what that actually illustrates is how, when I looked at a record, what it made me curious about and further things I looked at. So if you are afraid of falling in a rabbit hole, that is something to be careful from with uh, looking at town records. I mentioned that there were taxes. So this is from Framingham in 1700 in the first volume on the fifth page, and they were doing a tax for the minister of John Swift, who was their first settled minister. I highlighted and underlined John Town, and you'll see there are several town, people with the name Town, and he, he paid three shillings, so that was the most. But then I noticed there were one, two, three, four, five other people who were underlined. Ephraim Town, Benjamin Provender, Philip Gleason, Nathaniel Wilson Jr., and John Frost, who only paid nine pence. So what these lists can show you is, uh, potential family members and who tended to be wealthy and who was really um, just starting out. Here's an example of, I mentioned the doings with animals. And so wolves were a menace and a number of different towns had uh, ordinances or regulations so that if you brought in a, a wolf's head that you often got money. So I thought this was interesting. There were a number of different goings on starting in 1704 in Framingham, where John Eames Sr. brought a wolf's head to Thomas Drury, the select man, and John Pratt, the constable, to be dealt with as the law directs. If I was curious about this guy, I might have you know, looked further to see what the, the reward was. It wasn't until four years later that there were, you can see the listing below, and again, that's John Eames, who found a horse that was of chestnut color spelled interestingly with grizzled hair about the head, branded R on the shoulder and SH on the buttock. This is the closest I could come in horses to look like this guy, this is not his horse. Um, but you get an example of names being mentioned. So I talked about boundary changes. So in Framingham in December of 1788, you can see in uh, town records, volume four, page 
2010, they chose a committee of three people to meet with a committee from Marlboro to set off the northwest corner of Framingham with the town of Marlboro, and they were to report to the town for their consent, and they chose Colonel John Trowbridge, Captain Jeremy Belknap, and Lawson Buckminster. I was able by flipping through pages before and after to see that Trowbridge and Belknap were town assessors and Buckminster was the town clerk. I also noticed as I flipped through that Buckminster was often voted in to be on different committees. So you'll see that the town clerk is often a person of tremendous respect and they want him to do almost everything. I talked about the first settlers and this was so cool for me because my family has been coming to Bryant Pond, Maine since 1900 and actually built a, ca built a camp there that became a music camp. And so when I got a client who was the Cotton who wanted to me to research the family of William Cotton of the town of Woodstock where Bryant Pond is, I was so excited. And I had another client who actually um, had his family from Bryant Pond and he actually brought groceries to my great grandmother in the 30s. So it's, it's what I'm telling you is that whether you're researching your own family or somebody else's, it's really fun to find people in the records. So you see here, William Cotton and his wife were born in the 1780s. And then there are four children listed here, born from 1804 to 1813. So just because you see somebody listed with their birth date in the town doesn't mean that they necessarily were born there. It's extremely unlikely that William and Margaret were born there because uh, the area of Woodstock was really not settled at this point at all. I mentioned roads and I'll talk about David Mitchell a little bit later. I was researching uh, David Mitchell, who was the father of another David Mitchell, who was supposedly born in 1832 in Troy, Maine, in the county of Waldo. So the father, David Mitchell, was not in any deeds. He was not, his vital records weren't listed anywhere. He didn't have a probate record. He didn't have a tombstone. He literally, there was nothing except that he was listed in a bunch of town records. And in particular, he was listed in four different proposed roads and discontinued roads. So I'm just showing you here where it happens to mention that he, the road starts on the line between David and John Connor near the southeast corner of Libya Simmons. And then it shows that the county road is on the land of David Mitchell. What this means is when you put together these descriptions, you can pinpoint somebody on land, which can help you not only find friends, associates, and neighbors, but find out relatives. So I mentioned that ordinances can also show up. So Freeport, Maine, famous for L.L. Bean, was carved out of the town of North Yarmouth, Maine in 1789. So in the Freeport book one, page eight, you'll see that they voted to have this ordinance that there would be a committee to have the power to prosecute anybody who cut lumber from the school lot and to make the best use they could of the ministerial lot. All towns in New England were required to have a school lot, a lot for the meeting hall and a lot for the minister. But until they were actually filled with these different things, people would go on and cut down the lumber. This is a very sad tree that was cut off of the back of my property. And I thought it was a good lumber shot. You'll see a lot of my photographs as I wander around the state of Maine. I mentioned, we look at what happens to paupers. And so for many towns, they were actually bid out at vendu, which is French for sale. And what that meant was somebody needed different services and people would say, if you pay me $40, $27 or $12, I'll take care of Widow Chase, Sally Chase or John Chase. And so if you just look at this list, you can see a lot of things by looking at who is taking care of people and how much you're paying for them. So if we look at Sally Chase, Meshach, I love that name. I, he was one of the guys who walked in the fiery furnace. I don't know if you remember that from the, from the Bible. 
he and Abednego. Anyway, Meshach Purrington for $27 was willing to look after Sally Chase, but he required $88 to look after Nathaniel Mugford and his wife, which makes you think they were a lot of trouble. If you look down below, um, you'll see I underlined William Young's children, three children to Ebenezer Allen for $30. I was looking for Ebenezer Allen, but I I ended up writing an article on um, poor records because I thought this was so cool and about the poor house. But look at that. William Young was bid off to leave Levi Hawks for only 75 cents. I imagine he was probably like Paul Bunyan and did all sorts of chores and was more like a servant or a slave than somebody who was being taken care of. You may notice Black Lucy in there, who was a beloved member of Wyndham, Maine for many years. And eventually, when you see her fall off the rolls is when she passed away. So you can use these pauper records in a number of ways by seeing what the family groupings were. Um, perhaps the year before, you see um, when Widow Chase wasn't a widow. So you can pinpoint exactly when her husband died. So they can be wonderfully helpful. I mentioned that you can learn about disease management. So for Ipswich in 1800, they um, passed a regulation saying that those who were exposed to smallpox from Charles Treadwell were to repair to John Simmons within 24 hours to be inoculated at their own cost. So you can see back then, people were actually sometimes being vaccinated. You'll also see people being quarantined so you can learn who was the typhoid Mary or the typhoid Charles and who was the doctor. I was looking for the Bragdon family who lived in Durham, Maine. And uh, there was one vital record for Jonathan, but Jonathan Bragdon showed up in a number of different records. You see him underlined here in Durham, Maine, in 1800, he, this was a list of 91 people that was the pool from which the 12 men who were going to try a particular case, and these are called the petty jurors. The grand jurors are the ones who evaluated the evidence to decide if they should go to trial. So between this list of 91 and the list of the other people, you get most of the adult males in the entire town. I ended up having so many clients from Durham, Maine, that I decided to transcribe the vital records of Durham when I was president of the Maine Genealogical Society, which was an incredibly cool project. So I'm going to move on now that you've seen some examples of these treasures so that we'll look at how were towns created in New England and you'll get a sense of what this was like. Many people came to Massachusetts for religious freedom, but not everybody did. A lot of them were looking for just opportunities in the new world. They tended to settle along the coast, not only because it was easier to go up and down the coast to travel on the water or on the rivers than it was to go by land, but also so you could get back to England if you decided it wasn't so much fun after all. There were Native Americans here who in many cases tried to be friends, but in many cases they were mistreated and there were many wars that led to the abandonment of a number of settlements and sometimes loss of records as well as loss of lives. The colonists found that compact settlements were a lot easier to defend and sometimes you'll find in the town records they'll talk about garrison houses and where people were supposed to repair in the case of attack. When the towns were formed, they tended to follow English townways and English laws. Now, as, as for Maine, and I really love this book, I highly recommend it, by Charles E. Clark, The Eastern Frontier, The Settlement of Northern New England, 1610 to 1763. It's about the early founding of Maine and New Hampshire. But this quote really captures Maine versus Plymouth. The stocky, tough men first settled the craggy islands and the sand and salt marsh harbors of the Maine coast lived to fish and trade, not prey. So it's <laughs> imagine the difference in the town records where you've got Puritans who believe everybody should go to church on Sunday and then finding these guys for going out and fishing on Sunday. People also came to New England because there was a lot more land here than there was in Europe. 
and there was abundant fishing both in the ocean and on the streams, lumber, water power, and furs. Something else that happened in the early settlements is that the original areas that were settled became crowded and so people would move to slightly further away and form separate villages. Eventually only remote areas had good land and they moved to the boontocks such as Worcester or even New Hampshire and Maine. And often masses of people from a particular town moved together or invested together. So for example, I showed you the poor records of Wyndham, Maine. Wyndham was originally called New Marblehead because people from Marblehead invested in, and many of them moved to Wyndham, Maine. Warfare often led to the creation of new towns in four different ways. There were military marches from New Hampshire and other parts of New England heading up to Canada where people would spot land that they thought would eventually make uh, a beautiful place to live. Because the government had very little money to reward people for this military service, they often gave out land grants, which sometimes were given out many years later. So for example, when I was looking through I was leading a project to index the early deeds of Cumberland County, Maine, and I came across this place called Sudbury, Canada, and I thought, oh my goodness, did Cumberland County go, go all the way up to, was it part of Canada? Well, actually, it was one of the Canada towns, which, and you'll see places called like the Narragansett town because they were part of military marches to Canada. Sudbury, Canada eventually became Bethel, Maine. And the people who founded it were getting grants for people who served in the war maybe 70 years earlier. It's kind of really interesting story. Maine became a buffer zone from Indian attacks from Massachusetts so that over time, the government did invest in some settlements in Maine so that they really would be coherent and stop the Native Americans from rushing down. And as I mentioned, the compact settlements were safer, and so they tended to form towns. Towns sometimes divided from larger towns into smaller towns, and we'll see this with Ashland as an example. So that while Ashland became incorporated in 1846, you can see records going back to the, the mid 1700s relating to Ashland. So the reasons why these towns divided is the settlers were too spread out. It was hard to get to church or the government. It was hard to defend. It was too large to manage and frequently people were fighting over different aspects. So I've shown you an, uh, a map of North Yarmouth, Maine as it existed. It was somewhat in that blue square that you see here. And Eventually, it was carved off into the first that split off was Harpswell in 1733. Freeport was carved off in 1789. I think Cumberland was about 1808. Um, then came Pownall, and Yarmouth didn't separate from North Yarmouth until 1849. What this means in terms of town records is, is that if you want to find the records of Yarmouth, you need to look at the old records of North Yarmouth. If you want to find the early rep records of Harpswell, you need to look at the records of North Yarmouth. If you want to look at early records of Freeport prior to 1789, you need to look at the old records of North Yarmouth. So you've got to learn town histories and you need to learn when these splits occurred. Now Ashland actually was formed from the surrounding towns, um, not all of from Framingham, Holliston and Hopkinton. So you've got people settling as early as the 1650s on Danforth's farm, which became Framingham. In seven, 1710, people started settling in Holliston, which was officially incorporated from Sherburne in 1724. Hopkinton, which was a praying Indian town called something like Magunkoy, was incorporated in 1715. And people were in the area of Ashland for sure in the 1750s. 
as early as 1833, people from Ashland petitioned to have Ashland formed from these larger communities. So Framingham went down like this, Hopkinton came up like that, and Holliston was down like this. Only 10% of the people voted for it. And so it wasn't until 1846 that they had the support to become an incorporated town. So I really encourage you to look at the at old maps. Um, this is from, from a county atlas of Middlesex County in 1875. So you can see what the names of the sur surrounding towns are. I had one ancestor, I thought they moved three times and they lived in Fitchburg for a while, which kept changing its boundaries. In this instance, you see that Worcester County happens to already border it. So when I went through and I looked at the history of Ashland, I saw that an area around here was called Salem's End because people in the 1690s who were being persecuted for witchcraft in Salem fled to this area. So the, um, I also looked at a number of different records in the Ashland history and was trying to pinpoint districts. So there was one guy who actually bought land between Franklin Street and Olive Street here. So if you take the time to plot it, you can really see where different pieces of land came from and when they were settled. Well, what did it mean to become an incorporated town? Well, they had to receive a charter for the crown, the state, or the commonwealth, which gave them the powers, privileges, immunities, duties of towns. They had to have elected officials. And in New England, town government is the main form of government. There's also county government, but a lot of it is town-based. Unincorporated towns exist by tradition. They don't have a state charter and they don't have elected officials. In Maine, there are a number of places that are still called plantations and they are unincorporated towns because people don't want officials telling them what the heck to do. Ipswich, for example, in 1819 was voted to um, the second parish became the town of Essex. This actual document here, this page, is in your handout that you'll get later on. I thought you might be interested in just reading what one of them looked like, because it's very interesting to, to look at what the original description of the town is. So they mentioned various names like Cogswell, Choates, Hamilton, Manchester, and Gloucester. Um, we're going to get on to the uh, proprietors and town creation. I didn't know if there were any questions at this point or if you wanted me to keep going. I don't see any questions in the chat. Does anybody have anything they'd like to ask? You can unmute yourself if you'd like. I don't know if this question's too early. My name's Anne. And um, you mentioned about these different ways of um, looking up things, vital records, historical, historical records and things like that. So how would you search that? Or would you just use this um, family search and then it would give you okay, a we list will, of those? Okay, we will be talking about that later. Thank okay. you for bringing right. that up. All right, thank okay. you. All right, are we ready to go on to the proprietors? I first, thank you for your question, Anne. Um, I, I really, okay. I just saw that Richard had unmuted himself. Yes, okay. I had a question. Um, do you have any like general advice? Because like I'm first generation American. So like most like none of these like stuff like really like help me because like my parents are the first ones that came here. So none of like the town records and all that can help me. But like, do you have like any general like advice or like any any general tips that like can like that are usually like good advice to give, like finding oh. records? Well, I'll tell you, we're, when we get to question and answers, we'll see if I can help you because this town, this talk really is focused on town records and particularly on the early ones. But it's also important for you as a, where do you happen to live, Richard? I live in Framingham, so, but I was like, okay, I'm so, generation, yeah. Right, but it's still interesting for you as you go to different sections of town, of, of the town, to learn about what the history is like, because you'll notice a lot of people in New England, like I'm a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. 
I'm even a Yankee fan. I am going <laughs> to talk instead of waiting to see if Aaron Judge is going to hit a home run 61. This is a <laughs> sacrifice for me. But New Englanders are very tradition bound. And so to learn about the roots of New England will be of benefit to you, whether or not it helps you in genealogy. But we'll talk more. Maybe we'll have a chance for some tips at the end. OK, right, thank you so much. Thanks for chiming in. All right. Mm -hmm. I first became interested in the proprietors when we were looking at the registers of deeds because they kept being listed. And so I wondered who they were and why they were so prominent. So they were the original grantees or purchasers of attractive land, usually a township, and they, their heirs, people they assigned their ownership to or their successors and people they let admit held this in common ownership. In the 1600s, the proprietors, in effect, were the town. But by the 1700s, the proprietors were separate from the town, and you might find separate records. Uh, Henry Knox was one of the great proprietors. He was a very good general, and he saved Boston by dragging cannons from Ticonderoga. Ticonderoga. But he tried to set up his own <laughs> fiefdom in Maine and wasn't horribly successful. The town proprietors were interested in settling a town, and there might be as many as 60 of them. They often were well off and inherited or purchased the right. And as a reward, they got free land influence in their own best sites and a chance to invest. They were well-connected gentlemen. Uh, they thought they were, they were very snobby. They thought they were the cat's pajamas, um, and they were supposed to direct and guide the improvement of the lowly common folk. They were supposed to review their claims. And they had this blueprint for an orderly, moral, stratified society. Um, this is a replica of the Knox Mansion, which now overlooks the Dragon Cement Plant in Thomaston, which is surely not where Knox had it originally. It was on the river. Um, the proprietors were responsible for petitioning the government to settle a town, to convince people to come, to survey the town get the home lots, build roads. They were given deadlines, which were often extended, but if they were extended too many times, the land is sheeted back to the government. So just to summarize some of the things these proprietors needed to do, they were supposed to build a meeting house and get a minister. They were supposed to clear and manage the, law, the land. And they were supposed to build sawmills and grist mills because without lumber and without corn and other things ground so that you could eat them, people wouldn't stay. They were supposed to build schools and houses, and they kept records. This is an actual photocopy of the Pajepscott Proprietors Book Number One and part of the deed from the six Sagamores to Richard Wharton. Pajepscott included the area of Brunswick, where I live, and, and Topsom and a couple of other towns around here. They're really beautiful books to look at. So we'll look for a few moments at what are some of the challenges in developing new towns. Before I flip to the next slide, I thought I might ask some people, well, what do you think was really hard about trying to create a town in the 16 or 17 hundreds? What do you think would have made it hard? Native Americans. Yes, that was a big issue. What else? Recruiting numbers of people. Yes, yes, getting convincing people to come. And this slide is a, cl a clue. As we say in Maine, it was wicked cold. And the, the temperature was much colder than, than it is now. It was very risky and dangerous. It was a lot of work. There was no guarantees it would succeed. And there were a lot of dangerous animals that might eat you or your um, or your animals or your crops. Uh, because of warfare, I was startled to find out that between 1689 and 1713, only Wells, Kittery, and York, Maine stayed fully occupied. It was such an issue, the abandonment of Maine towns, that there was a committee for the settlement of Eastern lands in Massachusetts. Um, Maine was still a, col a district of Massachusetts, and so they selected Saco, Scarborough, Falmouth, Rusick, and North Yarmouth for settlement, which meant they were actually going to help these communities and ignore other ones. Uh, Brunswick and Topsom were added shortly after that. They had to 
tame the wilderness and build roads. Because if you didn't connect to other settlements, how on earth were you going to get any resources or meet with the rest of humanity? They were required to improve land and create farms. They had to do everything themselves. They did not have a Home Depot. And here's just a picture of some rocks that I took. How many of you have seen rocks like this when you're going for a walk in the woods and you say to yourself, what on earth is a rock wall doing here? Well, it's because it used to be a farm and somebody gave them up in it and it grew back to be woods. Getting a minister. So there we see Cotton Mather. How likely was he to want to go be a minister in the sticks of Massachusetts or in Maine? Uh, it was hard to raise money and Often the town broke their promises to pay the minister or build their, them a home, but often the ministers behaved in a very scandalous manner. And you can see some of this in the town records. Getting the government to help was really hard. It was often very far off. Uh, you frequently were far away from the county seat and they weren't interested and gave little help. There were frequent land disputes. I highly recommend this book if you're interested in this about between the Great Proprietors and the Liberty Men by Alan Taylor. He's a wonderful writer. Um, they were overlapping grants because people hadn't bothered to survey the land. While there were Indian deeds with people that the proprietors didn't necessarily recognize them, they fought with the squatters. There were various boundary issues. Um, when I went to the town of Bowdoin, I showed you the sign that it had fallen over and I was copying town records. The town clerk told me that one of her ancestors was one of the surveyors who tried to survey the boundary of Bowdoin and was shot at by some of the squatters. And so part of the town boundary is still not made because they scared them away. So the records also show up in the court battles too. It was hard to decide on priority. People didn't have very much money. What were they gonna spend it on? School, church, road? poppers. So you can see there were a lot of things people had to do, and there were a lot of officers created or offices to deal with this stuff. Many of the offices like this exist today. They will tell you a lot about what a town was like at the time. The positions and number varied. The town clerk was one of the most important posts, and you really hope they had good handwriting. Many selectmen still uh, run the towns. Do selectmen run Ashland, Mina? We do have a select board, yes. Yeah, so it's, you know, sometimes you'll have a mayor, but in many cases, it is run by these people, and they're often elected year after year. They tend to be wealthier, educated, and influential, and sometimes they were the assessors and the overseers of the poor. The assessors determined the value of property, uh, which was important because people didn't have money. And so if you got sued, you'd, get, you'd have to give off part of your property or they would assess the, the value of an estate. The constable acted as the local sheriff and then you had the tax collector. Tithing men were interesting. They collected money for the church and they monitored behavior in church and at homes. And they had this thing called the tithing stick, which had a feather on one end and a knob on the other. And they used the knob to bonk the men and the boys to wake up in church and the feather to tickle the girls and the women. The school district agents were responsible for finding teachers, ensuring they got some money. They had a place to teach and eventually building a schoolhouse. There were various reeves who really, a reeve was an official of a local district. So the sheriff, derives from the word Shire Reeve, the Reeve of the Shire. Hog Reeves had the unfortunate job of running after loose hogs and bringing them back. And often if you see somebody elected Hog Reeve, they were uh, a newlywed young man. Deer Reeves chased after the deers and the pound keepers uh, were responsible for building a pound. This is actually a photograph of the Durham, Maine cattle pound near Bradbury Mountain. And they would then charge somebody so much money for coming to get their animal. There were also fence viewers who ensured that fences were maintained properly so that animals didn't get out or get in. People were responsible for ensuring that, that weights and measures were correct. And you'll even see this now on gas stations where they'll say it's approved by the sealer of weights and measures. Sealers of lumber were very important because 
how could you build your house if you didn't have it? They were colors of various things who sorted things by size and quality so they could be sold. So you, sometimes you'll see their colors of hoops and staves to make barrels or colors of dried fish, which sounds like a most unappealing job to me. The surveyors of the highway are really important for genealogy research. Because we didn't have a transportation department, the roads were completely created, maintained by the local inhabitants, and they had to make them go from paths to eventually paved roads. So the surveyors of the highway didn't do surveys, and they really weren't highways. What they did was they kept the roads, they either built the road or kept them passable by ensuring the people in their particular road district or a highway district did the work they were supposed to do. And you were required as an inhabitant to provide so many days of service on the road. So I'll show you an example. So from Freeport in 1820, there were literally 27 districts and 29 surveyors. I was looking for Ephraim Allen because I was researching the Allen family, which was um, not only in Freeport, but also in, in Durham. And I underlined Benjamin Porter and Timothy Prout because when you look at maps of the place, you'll see Porter's Landing and Prout's Neck. So some of these names of these early settlers, you'll see where the names came from. I provided this slide of Holliston and the officers in 1724 to illustrate how often really prominent people had several different positions. So you'll see that John Goulding was a selectman and a town clerk. And you'll see Thomas Marshall in red there, who was a selectman. He was an assessor and he was a tithing man. And then you'll see Abraham Cousins was the treasurer and assessor. And then you'll see some other cousins there. One was a surveyor of the highway. And then you'll see Jacob Cousins, who probably was married around that time. You'll see there's a, a clerk of the market as well. Notice though, there are only two surveyors of the highway, not 29 like they were in 1820. So you see this will give you an idea of how big the community has gotten or how spread out it is. I wanted you to see this slide because this is Ipswich in 1801 and it shows that the town clerk, Colonel Nathaniel Wade was only paid $10 for the year. The town treasurer, Honorable Stephen Choate got $17. And the selectmen, who also served as assessors and overseers of the poor, got all of $25 to work 325 days a year. I thought something was really fascinating about this meeting is they tried to get two constables. And so Major Abraham Lord agreed right away. But Alan Baker, Captain Joseph Story, and John Fell Fellows all disagreed before William Burnham finally agreed. Doesn't it make you wonder what kind of either a rowdy bunch these people in Ipswich were, or maybe nobody wanted to work with Major Abraham Lord, or maybe it was something else. But I, you know, suggest looking at the meeting procedures can get you to wondering what's going on. So now we're going to get to your question of where do you actually find these records? Going to the town office or city hall is highly recommended and I'll give you some tips on what to do about that because the records are a lot easier to read there and they also go right up to the current year, whereas the ones online do not. Many of them can be found in historical societies, libraries and archives. The Family History Library itself in Utah and FamilySearch.org has microfilmed and digitized many of them, but they certainly don't go all the way up to today. So you're gonna to have to use some other methods. For New England, the New England Historic Genealogical Society in Boston and their website will have a number of them, as will the Massachusetts State Archives. They're often in published books. So if you go on Google and you list a town for a particular year and you put town records, you'll often see some of them might actually be in book form and you'll be able to download them. I found like the history of Ashland by doing a Google, Google search. The Maine Genealogy Society has its mission to transcribe the vital records of Maine. So I mentioned that I had done this in 2018 because I, I picked Durham, Maine because I had so many clients there that I felt like I knew all the people who had lived there a long time ago. 
this is a really interesting issue of American Ancestors, which is published by the New England Historic Genealogical Society. This fall issue also contained guidelines for how to do main research if you happen to be interested in that. You can also look at town reports, which so as a as a inhabitant or a citizen of Ashland or Framingham, you probably have received the annual report and you'll notice it'll tell you who was born, married and died. It'll tell you who owes back taxes. It'll list the selectmen and what people voted on and what repairs happened. Um, and sometimes they'll have a whole run of them at the town office and sometimes you'll get them at uh, the library or an archive. In using family search, this is the method you will use. So you go to the website, you need to register. You don't have to pay anything, but by registering, they'll give you wider access to data. So if you go to the search screen and you click on search catalog, then what you do is you type in, and you can see here, Massachusetts, Essex, and Ipswich. And then I clicked on town records, and then that brought down these records. But notice it says proprietor's records from 1634 to 1905. That's not the present. And the town records are from 1634 to 1864. Well, Ipswich wasn't um, a town as, er <laughs> as early as 1634. So you don't know what these records actually cover until you actually look at them. Something else that's very important um, about looking for town records is to know what county it's in and to also check county records. And the counties and the towns included in them often changed. This book, edited the sixth edition that came out this year, edited by Rhonda McClure of the Genealogist's Handbook for New England Research, will let you know when all the towns in New England became separate entities, when they were incorporated, what records they have at the New England Historic Genealogical Society, if it was known by other names, and if it was formerly part of another town. So when I was looking at Tewksbury, I found it was originally part of Bill Rica, or as I used to think, Billy Rica. Um, I think Bill Rica's right, is that right, Bill Rica? I think it's Bill Rica. Yeah, but it isn't Billy Rica. In no. any case, it's all these towns exist, so you can tell who the foreigners or the people from away are because you'll mispronounce them. So Bill Rica was settled in, or Bill Rica was settled in 1634, and it was incorporated only 18 years later. It has daughter towns that were split split off from him, from them. So you can see um, that you've got Bedford and Carlisle and Tewksbury. And Wilmington were all originally part of Billerica. Tewksbury was settled at the same time, same time but was only in, was incorporated a hundred years later, and it had a da daughter town, Lowell, which started to be settled around 1653 and was incorporated much later, in 1826. So you can see this book is really helpful for you pinpointing what other places you need to look for records, if you're looking for these old records. Keys to success. You've got to learn about the town's history. And I recommend learning about it, even if you're not doing genealogy. I think it's important to know about uh, where you live. I wasn't from Maine, I'm from New York, but like when I lived in Falmouth, I did a lot of research about where I lived, which ironically, when I became a genealogist, became very helpful. And I could look at houses and know not only who lived there in the 1700s, but when the houses were moved from different sections along Route 88. So if, if you like going for walks and looking at old houses, this can also be fascinating for that way. But you learn from these histories why and when it was settled, if there were boundary or name changes, who were the proprietors and the initial officers, what were the main religions at different times, so you want to look for church records, were there any disputes? Was the town ever abandoned or records lost? Uh, this is a very helpful resource for towns in Massachusetts. Barbers, the history and antiquities of every town in Massachusetts. Because it was originally published in 1839, you're not going to see Ashland in there, but you will see Hopkinton, Holliston, and Framingham. 
these resources that I've listed here are also in your handout and I've mentioned them, so I'm not gonna go into them now. Another key point is to identify everybody, get familiar with who lived in the town and what the different districts are. Now, of course, they're from different nationalities, whereas back then they more tended to be um, English or possibly Scot-Irish or German or Swedish. Um, but you wanna look through the census as well as the census of the town might exist in the journals and the books themselves. Look for common surnames and neighborhoods. And then you wanna look for districts or parishes and there'll be different districts for taxes, schools and roads. These will help you find your friends, associates and neighbors. If you use cadastral maps, which have people's names, they will help you find out where people lived. There are many excellent county atlases for New England starting in the mid 1800s. Some of your ancestors or people you're looking for sold the land before the map was created. So this is a map of Rentham in 1880 and you wanna know where your ancestor lived. Well, if you go back and look at the the land that they owned and you look at who they sold it to and who they sold it to, eventually you might find that you, uh, your ancestors lived on this particular piece of land. I mentioned before how I use the town road descriptions to point David Mitchell to William Mitchell's land here. And this happens to be the town line with Unity, which was known as 25 Mile Pond plantation because it was 25 miles from Fort Halifax and Winslow. So this map doesn't list David, but I was able to tell from all these descriptions that he clearly lived on William Mitchell's property. I went to the Unity Historical Society and they had this map and it showed that this is the border of the town that you see here. And it shows Andrew Bennett, Libby Simmons and John Carner and so uh, Andrew's land went through here, this land. So what you also know is you can sometimes find Andrew Bennett, Livia Simmons and John Carter and William Mitchell in the town records of Unity or in the town records of Troy um, depend, because they lived so close to the border. You wanna use the original records whenever possible. So go to the town or city hall plan and call ahead. There are various reasons why the town office or can be really busy, especially around voting time, especially around contentious things. Dog registration time. One time when I went to Bowdoin, they were registering their dogs and it seemed to me every member of town had at least five dogs and each dog had three names. This took forever. Um, so you want to talk, call the town clerk beforehand and find out if it's a good time. And also, if you know which volumes of the records you're interested in looking at, uh, and be aware of how many different duties they have. It's not just their job to help genealogists. I had a New Yorker's attitude because I was on the clock and would come zooming in, and I had to really put that on hold and really, really slow down. You want to check both the original and the typed records because they could be mistakes. And you want to write the source on any of the copies while they're there. And I make the copies in the first day and then I go home and then see what I'm missing and go back at least a second day. Now, if you live in the town you're researching, this is a lot easier. But if you have to, if you have to get a hotel, you want to make sure you're not going at a bad time. You want to review the whole bit, book and an index if there is one because the contents are scattered all over in no logical order. The clerks used any space. Sometimes they wrote, wrote sideways and the vital records are sometimes in separate books are mixed in. So you see births are on pages 348 and 9 and 435. Death on 503 to 7 and in 576. Marriages are in a separate book. They're just, everything's jumbled all over the place. I did find that Ho um, Holliston actually had an index for some of their early records and it was on family search. So I knew that I, I looked under A and there was A for Ashland, 1846, set off from Holliston in town book six on page 73. However, this film is locked. I need to go to a family history center if I wanted to look at what that actually looked like. But B had a lot of interesting topics, including 
boundaries, bounties, bylaws, burying grounds, birds, etc. So you need to check in a lot of different places. You want to look through a number of different meetings. Not only will you understand the town process, but you'll get used to the handwriting and spelling. So I have this page actually in your handout um, so you can get an idea of what it looked like. Uh, take notes on it and make copies. This was actually a photocopy, which because of the reflective paper that it was in, and because of the, ref of the um, fluorescent lights, I had to take these pictures sitting under a tiny table on the floor. I highlighted some of the things relating to expenses, just for fun. Uh, Jonathan Flint was given um, one pound and seven shillings and eight pence for services done in the previous year. Andrew Dunning got seven shillings and eight pence for putting records in the town book. But this was the one that really caught my attention. Voted to give two pence, spelled T-O-O, -O, per head for all the crows that shall be killed on the neck before the 20th of October. Next, no, you did not have to strangle crows. There was a harpswell neck. But I just love the old wording of this stuff. You want to use these with other sources. So Richard, this is where you want to, um, you can look at recent town records and your ancestors, um, if they've been in a town for a while um, and they've purchased land or done something, they may be in the re recent records, but you want to see if there are other things, for example, if they've bought land, who did they, you want to look at the deed books. So you want to, um, make sure you look at it with every other source. So I'm going to summarize and then we'll open this up. I think that we have a small enough group so we can, everybody can unmute and we can have a little bit of a discussion. So people came to New England for religious reasons, for land, natural resources and opportunities. And despite many challenges, settlers were able to establish towns which followed English customs. Warfare had a huge impact Towns were sometimes abandoned and records destroyed. Many towns divided and changed their names. You need to know that. So you look in more than one town and you've got to look at the earlier, larger towns. You want to know all about the town history. So some of the kooky things you find make some sort of sense to you. You want to realize that the proprietors were critical to the town's success and check the records. And sometimes you'll find the, the earlier names of the towns were for proprietors. Recognize how many responsibilities the town officers had. So if your ancestor was one, you can really appreciate it. These records have amazing details and they go all the way up to the present time. You want to use them with other sources, but mostly want to take the time to find, search, study, and appreciate them. Thanks for listening. Let's open up the discussion. And for those of you who stayed awake for the whole time, congratulations. Give yourself a pat on the back. I, I one time gave a talk to a woman's club and they had me do a very detailed talk on uh, using deeds. And my goal was that for the hour talk that everybody was awake for at least three minutes. <laughs> but I, but I, set a higher stand, I had set a higher standard for you guys. <laughs> um, so this is what we're gonna do. Carol, do you wanna turn off of your off your share screen? Oh, look, we actually have a bunch of people. Yeah. If, if people are willing to please um, put their faces on there so I can see who's here, um, we're not going to record you on YouTube. You, But I will just like to know, you got to see me for a whole hour. And delightful as that is, I'd like to see you. So if those of you who are hiding would be willing to let me see your, your smiling faces, I would be so happy. Awesome. Uh, and... Mm. I see that. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Whitney. All right, come on, you shy people. Yeah. I mean, I'm an um, people are starting to unmute, so I will go ahead and call on you if you're unmuted. Is that okay? Okay. So, Anne, I saw you unmuted first. Oh, I just basically wanted to know my question from earlier because I've done some research and I've had other family members do research. And I just wanted to know, like, if I look up, you know, on that first site, I think it was family search and I put like a name in or something, is it going to give me all those different records or do I have to go under different? No, 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 no. So it sounds like you're, 
kind of new in genealogy? Or yes. Not. Yeah. Yes. All right. So, the, you know, this is a really quite an advanced topic. So it's kind of, you know, you're going through something really sort of fascinating. When I started out, you know, it was like, mm -hmm. look for vital records, and then go to the census, and then eventually probate, and then land records. But town records, I, you know, I started researching in 1980. I didn't start using town records till almost 2000. So you're wow. hearing about you know, this is a specialized thing. It's just that if you are researching anybody in New England, not right. everybody has town government. You'll go to other states and they'll go, what do you mean town records? I mean, literally, they go back to sometimes the 1630s all the way up to 2022. And they have such detailed things. So town records are not the first thing that I would go to. And family right. search, um, what I would recommend if you're you, if you're new is, there are a number of really wonderful um, webinars on beginning genealogy. So I recommend going mm -hmm. to those first. And also for if Richard, Richard, are you still with us or do, do we lose you? I'm here. Hi there, Richard. So Hello. you definitely want to be, uh, go to take advantage of that. But there are also some wonderful books on um, beginning genealogy. A lot of people think they can use DNA now and being their ancestors are going to show up. And the answer is no. Um, there are actually seminars on how to use family search. And so they have, um, if you go on that site, the Church of Latter-day Saints has done a lot to preserve genealogy records throughout the world. And they're recently right. digitizing them. I really do recommend going to some webinars or in-person conferences on introductory right. to topics <clears throat> if you're new, because I get it's there's mm -hmm. too much time to explain family search. Right. What I was trying to show you is that you can go in and list people's names and stuff, but if you want to find okay. the town records, that's how you find the town records. Oh, okay. So um, Yes. Jan, do you have a question? Oh, uh, so yeah, I wanted to make a comment because okay. my last name is Parsons, and I married into the Parsons family who started out in Gloucester, Mass. Uh -huh. And eventually uh, they were running, they were farmers, not fishermen. So they were part of a group that went to Maine and founded New Gloucester, Maine, which is just a uh -huh. little bit north of exactly, the Portland area. Exactly, exactly. And a then some of them went on to Norway, Maine, and then some of them went west, but others went to Lincoln, Maine. And it's, it's like a mini history of what you've been talking about, going back to Gloucester in the 1650s yeah. or so. And uh, it's uh, genealogy, if you happen to have ancestors that whether they've been 50 years or 300 years, it's a great way to learn the history of our area. And yeah, I mean, the reason yeah. why they didn't get to New Gloucester was because of the Native Americans. They, there were just too many wars going on. They could establish a place that they stay. Yeah, and it's it's interesting to if you look at some of the earlier names of the towns, they'll sometimes tell you the origin for where they are in Massachusetts. But there, there's this great sign in Maine that's got Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Paris, and Mexico. But New Sweden yeah. now some of them were just named that for fun. But New Sweden was actually founded by Swedes, so everybody there looks very you know the original are very very blonde. Carol, that's that's my husband's mother's side of the family. Yeah, <laughs> they were Sweden settlers in the eighteen. Whatever it was. So, dad's side, Gloucester, mom's side, New Sweden, <laughs> and old Sweden. Yeah. But a lot of these other towns, like Norway, they didn't come from Norway. It was originally called Rustfield yeah. because I guess Rust was one of the original settlers. He, he was from Gloucester. He was part of the Gloucester content, contingent. Um, so Nancy, do you have a question? I just have a comment. This was wonderful. I, oh, thank you. 
this has been a hobby all my life, but I got serious about it and started doing it properly about 30 years ago. And you really hit all the highlights and all oh, thank you. little ways. But I have to say it was interesting that you started talking about the death family. I bet I loved how many of there were. Well, they started out, they first settled in Sherbin and the bridge from Medfield to Sherbin is still called Death Bridge. <laughs> or the Death Valley. I know, and it would really, think how much it would throw off people from away. Well, I always thought that, but it's not really spelled that way. It's D-E-T-H, not death, death like you die. Yeah, but originally it was death. Yeah, but a couple of the men early on, a father and son in consecutive years, drowned in the river before the bridge was built. Oh, so, so it really yeah, was a death thing. It really was, but it's, so, it's still called Death Bridge. Amazing. So it's really, it's, it can be interesting, Richard, for example, at, you know, if you're going to be looking for recent immigrants, you've got to be able to look at more recent records. Um, and also, um, which country did your family come from? Um, they both came from Guatemala. You know, and, but so if you go on familysearch.org and you go mm -hmm. to their wiki, you can look at Guatemalan research. Oh, I, yeah, I've started doing that and I found information. I found like the vital sources from like both sides of my family but i think but it's it's really interesting to see where the i think it's fascinating to see where where names are called so for example here's a really cool name um north of camden is this mountain and there's a place called maiden's cliff and it's named for this girl whose hat flew off and she reached for it and fell off the cliff i'm like so don't wear a hat when you go to Maiden's Cliff. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I just think it's really, you know, it's fun to look at the names and try and figure out what they're from. Amazing. Other, th other either questions or comments? Heather? Yes. And so I've been tracing my people long before the internet as well. So um, I've been to many of the family history locations in Los Angeles, Salt Lake, all those kind of fun places. And a little sad that we don't have the equivalent out here quite the same, <laughs> but, but to your point, these town records can be chocked full of amazingness that's not transcribed. And I'm hot on the trail of a couple lines to the Mayflower and I'm not from the area. So I'm starting to learn more and more about the towns and all that. But, um, but I know some of the places that I'm getting caught up and as I talk with the people from the Mayflower genealogy groups um, I need to prove a couple of uh, people are born to certain people and then a couple of marriages mm -hmm. and so I think what I heard you say is that you know the people that I'm looking for while since I'm not finding them online um, I'm gonna have to start going to different sources um, and that might be to look to the towns that they might have lived in not necessarily right. born or died in is well, that right? there's that, but here's something that's really important. If you're trying to prove Mayflower ancestry, are you familiar with the silver books? Yes. No, I, and the thing is, I, I've got, my books are all aligned to my people, but then the book ends. And yeah, then you okay. need to, then you need well, to let me just like... say what the, the silver books are for people who don't necessarily know. They have, um, the Mayflower Society has been publishing these books to try and document the first five generations after people who came on the Mayflower. And so a lot of times people want to tie to that. So, so that's like the missing generation. Which towns were your ancestors from? <laughs> well, they're from all different ones. I mean, you've mentioned a bunch of them, I Ipswich and, and so on. But where I'm tracking is the one that I'm tracking right now that I think I'll be able to prove since I've got them in the books to the fifth generation, but I need to prove that we're part of the soul family that came out of New York. Oh, the souls. Oh my and gosh. And then yeah, went up to, and they turned into Gordonniers in, in um, Ontario, Canada, because they were loyalists and they had to leave after they lost. So this is where, and they came by way, there's, there's, you know, some in there from Dartmouth, but they kind of move all the way up as soon as, you know, the, the British lost and they had to run. So I, I'm needing to find some of these birth records of people from the US, but then the marriage records after that and subsequent birth, I imagine I'll have to go to Ontario or something like that. Have you gone to the New England Historic Genealogical Society on Newbury No, Street? I need to spend oh, you, some time yeah. there. That, it, while it isn't Salt Lake, it's got incredible records and not just on New England. I've, and they'll be very helpful for you. Um, yeah. The staff is just spectacular. 
and they're very good on colonial records. And they're, it's, if any of you have New England ancestors, it's really worth being a member. And then also the access to AmericanAncestors.org database, which is really cool. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. You can, can you repeat whole... that name? It, you said it's the New England Historical, I'm trying to write the exact name. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it happens to be listed on the syllabus, but I'll say it again. The okay. New England Historic, I think it's Genealogical Society. Society. In, in otherwise known as HisGen. <laughs> and their website is AmericanAncestors.org. If you go to that website, you can click on becoming a member. And um, But really go to the library. If they <laughs> fail it, if, what town are you in now? I'm in Stowe. Oh, in Vermont? No, in, in Massachusetts. <laughs> Skiing. I don't, I don't I know. know. <laughs> yeah, well, but it's, it's, really, it's really worthwhile going there. And um, another group for those, of, if you are serious genealogists, something else to think about is um, there's a, a really great society, the New England Association for Professional genealogist and you don't have to be a professional um but you can go to the meetings and stuff and you're nodding your head jan i yep. they really were a great help to me they do um they did some super duper webinars and stuff our annual meeting is coming up i think in november and josh taylor who you may know from the genealogy road show is sort of like the golden boy of genealogy um, but I've met, so what I really recommend all of you do is network. And so if you join these groups, um, you really get to know people and um, it's really kind of cool. I mean, I'll tell you a funny thing that happened today. So I'm walking along, I'm very, very, very nosy, which is a common trait of genealogists. And I'm walking down this road that has the potential for 13 houses. And I went in all the houses before they were finally built and everything. So I'm talking to this woman about the road and stuff and we're just, you know, talking about things. And I happened to mention, cause she's talking about the road association only has 13 people. Now think about it, this is a mini settlement. So I was the president of our association when we had 13 people. Oh, talk about like, you know, wrestling, boiled hogs or something just mm -hmm. the smaller the association the worse so anyway I mentioned that John Chase happened to be the the head of this um development John Chase is from Wyndham I'm talking about Yarmouth she lives in Brunswick and she says to me oh did you know he died last week now so somebody said to her do you know everybody in Maine? And the answer is no, but if you talk to anybody in Maine for an hour, you will find they know people you know. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, um, yep. I don't know if Massachusetts, I lived in New York City and it wasn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if you have any Maine ancestors, you wanna network with people who are there because they'll know family names um, and they know where they lived and stuff like that. I Carol, think I did you do genealogy question. in New York as well? Um, yes. I mean, my, I, I invite you to go to my website. Now, I'm technically uh, retired now. See, I'm not giving this talk at all, am I? No. Um, <laughs> no sooner did I retire than I got invited to do a whole bunch of webinars, but they're fun and I love to do it. Um, I take very few private clients because um, I'm really trying to write about my own family now. But you might be interested in looking at my website to get an idea of my background. So the, my areas of specialties follow my family. So I know a lot about West by God, Virginia, where my Scott Irish family and Welsh family went. I, I know quite a bit about New York City because I have a lot of um, ancestors there, but I have a lot of New England ancestors who go back pretty far. I haven't been able to get anybody to the Mayflower, but, and I know a lot about Maine, not because of my family being here, but just, you know, I started researching where my house and researching the road and researching the neighborhood um, and having lived in three towns in Cumberland County, then I started 
uh, transcribing the deeds of Cumberland County. And so I can go through some towns and I'll like know who, you know, I'll be walking on. I know who lived here in 1780. I know who, I know <laughs> who from that. So it's just like this, but I don't necessarily know who lives there now. Um, so a lot of people think I'm very uh, disoriented and perhaps they're right. Uh, <laughs> But I do know a lot about if you're interested in, I do do coaching. If people um, want to uh, contact me, you should have my email from uh, the syllabus or, you know, I think you can get it from Nina. Um, I'm glad to spend some time talking to you. I just don't want to do any large project myself because I, I, I don't have the time to do that. Other questions, or I love comments or things. So Rachel said in the um, in the chat that on Family Search, her her mom's family goes back to the BC days, and that it can be overwhelming because she doesn't know who to research first. BC, before Christ. Where is Rachel? <laughs> Rachel O'Brien. Show yourself. What do you mean you go back to the seat? If you have records before Christ, um, this is a good time to be skeptical. Um, just saying. Uh, now, if you're descended from royalty, and fortunately, kings were, like when you see the name Fitzroy, it means <laughs> bastard son <laughs> of the king. So if that's your name, hey, there you go. Um, so but in many cases, um, like if you if you look at DNA, sometimes people are um, find uh, genetic surprises and that the guy next door was the father and not necessarily who you thought. <laughs> um, so Rachel, you said you were overwhelmed with all the choices. Uh, how long have you been doing genealogy? Even if you don't show your face, will you speak? Um, she hasn't unmuted yet, but um, did you want to do that poll? Or oh, you... yes, I've been doing it for probably about, I, I started a little bit for the pandemic. Um, oh, okay. I was actually at the Top Show Fair um, and they had a family search group and I entered like my grandmother and a bunch of people popped up it was like the craziest thing like yeah. I never knew I'm related to so many people out there yeah you okay you have to be careful with DNA matches and also with the family trees that people are posting on the internet use those things as clues because um a lot of people will put up you know family myths or you'll you look sometimes they'll have somebody was uh, born and you know 10 years after their mother died I don't think so you know but then the other people will copy it so yeah, yeah it also shows like connected ancestors and all that and like who married who and I do have kings in the line yeah so you got yes yeah, the likelihood that you can go back to before Christ is uh, I, I start, the number one thing people say is start with the known and move back. Um, some people don't even necessarily know when they were born. Like when my grandmother um, passed away, she was, she really, I don't know if any of you watched the Today Show with when they had the Smucker's jar and would people put people who were a hundred on there. My grandmother really wanted Willard Scott to have her, <laughs> you know, have her picture on the smucker star. So she thought she was born on April 26, 1883. And she died on February 19th, 1991. But she actually was born a whole year earlier. She didn't even remember. And so her tombstones are wrong, her death certificates wrong. Um, and then we have Grammy Lorraine, who didn't want her husband, her husband never knew when she was born, didn't want her husband to know that she was much so much older than she was. And so my um, brother-in-law became her guardian. And when she thought she was dying, she whispered and she said, Tim, Tim, I have to tell you, I'm really seven years older than you think. I just thought you should know. <laughs> you know, so people lied about their ages. And I went to one cemetery and 
there are two, two tombstones for this guy, Benjamin Carver. He was either um, born, born in 1860 or, or 1861. Well, the, I believe the 1860 tombstone, because that was shortly after he died, the 1861 was added later with a wife. So may, when the wife died, who died maybe 50 years later. So you've got to, you need to learn how to critically review all these sources and find evidence that you think is believable. So even when you find something in the town records, I mean, sometimes these clerks lie or maybe there's um, a transitional error. I'll tell you one of the, the best ones I saw. Um, like, so let's say you look at a transcription of somebody's um, will. And so I was looking at my great grandfather, the one who built the music camp in Bryant Pond. And it said that this guy died and it listed um, his last name as Wiske, W-I-S-K-E. And they, they said that he had a son named DeWitt. And I went, really? So when, when I looked at the original document, it went da-da-da, to wit, then listed something. So this turned into a child. Um, when my um, grand, other grandfather died, it listed his two children. Um, I have an uncle John and my mother's name was Jane. And it listed the two children were John and James. So my mother had a sex change and it was repeated in about 10 newspapers. So my mother was James, you know, so th there's just, oh, Anne, are you trying to speak? Is Anne, you're not, you're muted. I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, were you talking? I could see your mouth or are oh, you talking? Somebody had come in and, <laughs> and so I was just telling her, she was asking me why I was on Zoom. So I was just explaining. Oh, oh sorry. I'll tell you something. Oh, that's okay. I'll tell you something really funny that happened in a Zoom okay. meeting. So somebody was, you know, a reasonably old lady, somebody in their 50s or 60s or 70s <laughs> was watching and they went to another room and all of a sudden their granddaughter was 10, showed up on the screen and she goes, wow, what are you people talking about? And she was so actively participating. <laughs> and I don't know what happened to the original person, but it was really fun. You know, so I encourage you all to, to not only read, but um, I find that researching people who are not your ancestors can really be helpful because we often want certain people to be our ancestors. And so this bias causes us to, you know, notice some things and not notice other things. Mm -hmm. uh, any other um, comments or uh, questions? I'll second. Other I'll second that whole idea that not to trust the trees online um, because mine is a great, great example. I started creating mine long before I realized it would become the gold standard of the people in my tree. Oh dear. Oh dear. 20 years from now. So, um, and the way I would do it is add anything that was possible and I would go back and research later. Well, a lot of these things I still don't have answers for. I have question marks all over, but people, I see the same exact, cause I type it in a certain way. So I know when I see it in other trees, I see it perpetuated over and over. And even if I put a note, this is incorrect. It just take things with a grain of salt and, and look at the notes that the, um, the tree maker might've made because that might also help you know which trees are more reliable or look at the, how many sources they have in the trees because it, it pains me <laughs> to see oh, oh, that right. information that I put out there, but I can't take it back. <laughs> all right, so then when you look at the source, so, so let's say um, it'll say uh, William Hunter and and I just saw that. was whatever age in 1860 or something. So then they'll sh they'll link it to, um, and let's say he lived in, um, you know, Tewksbury. So then they'll show the 1860 census, and it has William Hunter in Texas, and he's like 13, and that's their proof. I'm like, you know, it's clearly a different person. So just because they have sources, it doesn't mean you shouldn't look at it. And remember Grammy Lorraine, some people just didn't want their spouses to know how old they were. Um, I had one ancestor, uh, my great aunt Alice, who was an actress, and I swear to God, every census, she got younger. I thought she was like the <laughs> Benjamin Button or something. 
she was very glamorous looking. I have a picture of her on my website and she's, she looks so much like an actress, which is very cool. Um, any final things people want to say? I, I need to go find it if Aaron judges remember to how to, how to hit home runs again. I'm really getting very nervous. <laughs> it's taking way too long to tie Roger Maris. <laughs> stressing me out. Been watching every night too. So <laughs> are you a, are, are you a baseball fan? A Yankees fan? I, I am, but I, I, I'm a Red Sox fan. But, and you're um, still but I'm interested. I'm I was glad that he didn't get it while playing the Sox, but now I would like him to get it. He deserves to he deserves to pass. I was really impressed that they pitched him and Rich Hill. Look, yes. if you look at him. He looks like this old gizzard dude and he pitched great. Yeah, he did. So, yeah, but okay. I hope he does get his home run. Well, oh, thank two. you. Well, just let, letting you know, the first thing about history that I got interested in was baseball cards, and I was going to be a baseball card dealer. But I, you know, I I am a serious baseball historian, and um, because I grew up and my family was vaguely connected to the Yankees, I supposedly told the general manager of the New York Yankees to get out of the bathtub when I was three. I have no memory of this. <laughs> I hope I didn't Good story. see him. <laughs> I hope I didn't see him, really. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, why he was taking a bath in my grandmother's house, I have no idea, but it caused me to be very interested in baseball. So, well, I wish you all good luck on your journey. You're gonna be getting a handout. I think you'll find it really helpful. It's got the resources I mentioned. And also um, when I gave this talk for um, Tewksbury, not only did they record it, but they transcribed it, including the questions and answers. And then they published it. Oh, let's see. Can you see it now? No. <laughs> it's cause I got the background on anyway. It's listed on there, but it's in the Essex Genealogist in November of 2021. And um, Barbara Beakey did a wonderful job of uh, transcribing the talk, which is, was very similar to this one, but there was a great discussion about a lot of different things that was also included in the recording. And so you might find it interesting to see if you can get a copy of that. You're not that far from Essex County, so they, I would imagine the society has got um, copies of it. So it was only in November of 2021. And it's, she did a nice job in transcribing it and editing it. And it's even got some of my slides in it and it was kind of fun. Well, anyway, thanks so, so much. And I'm impressed a bunch of you even hung around the whole time, even though you're shy and you don't want me to see what you look like. I guess that is the advantage of Zoom. You can you just think if we were in the room, you'd have to put a paper bag over your head, but this way, this way you can visually mute yourself. So it was nice meeting all of you. Um, best of luck in your research. I hope you found it helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Thanks Good everybody night. for being here. And um, I will send out the recap tomorrow. Have a great night, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye. 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 Bye, Mina. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. I think I'm going to have to have you back for a, a baseball talk. <laughs> oh, I would love that. On baseball cards in history. Oh, that would be cool. <laughs>